with the sheriff's department, you know, I eventually um, I started to work cold case homicides with Biggie Smalls, Christopher Wallace's case was an old cold case. It had been, you know, at robbery homicide division, it had been at our downtown homicide unit almost since the day it happened, which was back in March of 1997. So nearly nine years later in 2006, there's this renewed interest in investigating it as a cold case because I had been working cold cases and working cold cases under these kind of broad federal umbrellas, I was recruited in to be part of that new investigative team. So through investigating Biggie's case, because we always knew that Biggie's and Tupac's cases were probably going to be somehow related, we then began to investigate uh, Tupac's case. So remember, Tupac was killed in Las Vegas, not Los Angeles. Okay. They had jurisdictional responsibility for investigating it but because we stumbled on some information um as a result of biggie's case it opened us up to helping out with that so what what happened in biggie's case like what happened to biggie how'd he die yeah exactly like the background the story the there was there there's a lot of background that has to be understood in order to really wrap your head around how he was killed and why he was killed and that goes all the way back into um, animosities that stemmed out of New York all the way back to 1994. Tupac had been assaulted at a, at a, at a studio. He thought he had been set up. He thought that Biggie and maybe other people that were at the studio waiting for him had set him up. This led to some animosity. And then that animosity spawned, you know, this rivalry between Biggie and Tupac as artists. Well, we all know that, you know, Biggie was under the, you know, the umbrella of Bad Boy Records, Sean Puppy Combs's record label. And then ultimately Tupac came under the umbrella of Suge Knight's Death Row Records. Um, you know, um, um, so now you have an East Coast, a West Coast rap music companies that are kind of at odds. So there becomes friction between um, two, I'm sorry, there's friction between Suge Knight at Death Row and Puppy Holmes at Bad Boy because they had all ran into each other in Atlanta in 1995 and shot Combs' bodyguard shot and killed Suge Knight's bodyguard. So now there's this violent confrontation, somebody's dead and the animosity grows. So you've got the CEOs at odds, now you have their most most well-known artists, Biggie and Tupac at odds. And then they both began to associate with criminal street gangs. With Death Row, they're associating with Bloods. With Puppy Combs and Bad Boy, they're associating with Crips, who are already natural enemies. Right. So there's like three levels of hostilities going on between the CEOs and the artists and the entourages and the, you know, the groups that they're hanging out with. And this just begins to continuously fuel this fire between them all. And that that animosity, that conflict ultimately leads to the death of Tupac and Biggie. Right. So, I mean, was there a hit on Biggie? Like, I really don't know. I mean, I I understand he was killed. Biggie was killed as a result of Tupac being killed. Biggie was killed in retaliation for what had happened six months earlier in Las Vegas when okay. Tupac got killed. Okay. See, I didn't know it was it was after, and I didn't realize it was retaliation. Yeah, but he was killed in direct retaliation for Tupac's murder. So what happened um, with Tupac? How did that... I understand there was, you know, uh, animosity, but was there a, a, a yeah. series of events? There was a series of events. Most importantly was there... Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the song Hit Him Up with Tupac sung the song, really attacking Bad Boy Records, attacking Puffy Combs, attacking Biggie Smalls, claiming to have, you know, slept with Biggie Smalls' wife and all of these really incendiary um, um, claims and, and uh, threats. And so that was really something big. And um, after that song came out, you know, everybody just knew this conflict 
was not just going to go away. And, you know, when guys from Death Row Records would go to New York, they already knew that they were in Biggie's, they were in Puppy's backyard and there was already animosity. Same with Bad Boy. If they come to LA, they're in Shook's backyard and there's animosity. And this kept leading to conflict. Well, ultimately, it got down to the gang level where some gang members, uh, Suge Knight used to give all of his his entourage and the gang members that he associated with, he'd give them these big death row medallions. And some of them were like diamond encrusted death row medallions. They're very expensive, worth a lot of money. And so the Crips had, you know, um, decided that they would try to steal these medallions when given an opportunity. So one day at a mall here in Southern California, some Crips ran into some bloods, Suge Knight's friends, and one of them was wearing a death row medallion. The Crips attacked him and tried to steal that medallion. So that led to this, you know, big, big brawl at the mall. Now, months later, when they're down in, they're all in Las Vegas to see a Mike Tyson fight. The Crips used to go watch Mike Tyson. The Bloods would go watch Mike Tyson. Suge Knight was a big Mike Tyson fan. Tupac was a huge Mike Tyson fan. In fact, Tupac wrote the song that Mike Tyson um, walked out to the ring to the night that he was fighting in Las Vegas. So it's just all of this energy out there. And Mike Tyson knocks, his, uh, knocks out his opponent, Bruce Sheldon, in like less than a minute. Everybody's charged up. And Tupac's coming out of the arena with Suge Knight and other members of their gay, uh, members of the blood gang that Suge associated with. And one of those guys, the guy that had had his medallion stolen at the mall, was right with Tupac. And he said, Tupac. Look over there. See that motherfucker standing over there in the lobby? That's the guy that tried to steal my chain. And that's the crypt that tried to steal my chain at the mall. Tupac takes it upon himself. He runs over there and sucker punches this guy, not knowing really who this guy was. Right. And the rest of the entourage and then stomp this guy to the ground. And it's all on, you know, it's all on surveillance video that you can pull up on the internet. And you just see this big Donnybrook where they're stomping this kid to the ground. Oh, they had no idea what they, they had just, they had just opened a can of worms that they weren't going to get out of because that kid was a killer. So he went and found the rest of his crip friends and said, Hey, it's on. I just got sucked, punched by Tupac. I got stomped by Suge Knight and the rest of those goons. We're going to go get him. So they secured a weapon. They went on the, you know, they went on the hunt. Everybody in Las Vegas knew that Tupac and Suge. And everybody was going to be meeting over at this nightclub that Suge was um, uh, opening called the Club 662. And, you know, Mike Tyson was going to be there. Tupac was going to perform. It was going to be this big after fight party. Well, everybody knew, including these Crips, especially the one that they just stomped out. So they get themselves a gun and they go on the hunt, they go over to the 662. But at the time they got there, Suge and Tupac hadn't arrived yet. So they were leaving. And just as fate would have it, as they're leaving, they're not too far down the street. Here comes the entourage of Suge and Tupac and a bunch of other guys that are on their way to the club. They, they seize that opportunity. They pull alongside the car that Suge's in and start shooting into it. The young guy that uh, they had stomped out leans out the back window with a gun, fires the gun a bunch of uh, times into the BMW, strikes Tupac, which ultimately kills him. And that's how Tupac died. He punched the wrong guy. Right. So, who was the guy that got arrested recently? How does that so, play, how does that play into this? Yeah. So the guy that got arrested was the uncle of the kid who did the shooting, the one that they had stomped down, Orlando Anderson. Is his name. So his uncle Keefe D was the one that was just arrested. Keefe D is the, after Orlando Anderson is stomped down, he goes to his uncle. I says, hey, man, you know, Tupac just sucker punched me, shook, stomped me. We got to get it back. So Keefe D goes and secures a weapon from another associate of his. So he gets the gun. So okay. then he's in the Cadillac. He's in the suspect's car with his nephew. There's four people in that car. The driver, Terrence Brown, Keefe D, who's in the front passenger seat. His younger, his nephew is behind him in a passenger seat in the rear. And then behind the driver is a guy named DeAndre Smith. They're driving down the street. They, they see Tupac and Suge in the BMW. 
if he hands the gun to his nephew, Orlando, on the back seat, who then leans out the window and shoots. So Keefe D now is a, a, a co-conspirator in the murder. He, to see, he went out there specifically to, to shoot and kill Tupac and Shug. He got the gun. He handed the gun to his nephew and became um, part of the, um, you know, a, a, a willing member of the murder. So a willing participant, right? He's a co-conspirator. Co 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 uh, um, yeah. So... But now, like, there's, I guess, I, I, you know, people are assuming that there's going to be additional arrests. Like but when we spoke, you were like, ah, there's not going to be an arrest. Yeah. Everyone's dead. Orlando Anderson died in 1998. So just a couple of years after Tupac, after he shot Tupac, he ends up getting killed um, on the streets of Compton. Um, the other guy, the driver, Terrence Brown, I think he died in like 2015. He was in a marijuana dispensary an illegal marijuana dispensary in Compton it gets robbed he's in the middle of this robbery he gets shot and killed and then DeAndre Smith the guy in the back seat with Orlando um, he died early from health related issues he was really overweight issues that uh, he died of natural causes so nobody else in that car is alive anymore except for the uncle who you know went out and bragged about his role in the murder and Right. Is on Vlad is, uh, or something? Uh, Vlad. Yeah. Several platforms, Vlad TV. And he wrote a book about it called, you know, Compton Legend. So, you know, he wrote a book about his own participation. Murder. Yeah. It's funny because I'll, I'll interview guys and they're like, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm, some of this stuff I never got charged with and I'm concerned. I'm like, okay, well, it was like 20 years ago. Like, unless you're going to talk about murder, you, do. you know, you're talking yeah. about fraud. Like there's a five year latch statute of limitations. You know, maybe yeah. ten if it's a bank fraud specifically. I was like, you're 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 good. But yeah, murder, yeah. I would think you would know, hey, especially a high profile murder, you know, you probably shouldn't yeah. shouldn't brag. But it's funny because exactly. let's face it, even well, I don't know. I was gonna say people actually um go into police stations all the time and admit to murders and you, know, you still have to do an investigation. It's like, I still, we still need something other than just your word, but I guess he was there anyway. Yeah. And it was so. Yeah. It was relatively easy to corroborate the things that he claimed. Right. So how did that, so ultimately how did that lead, uh, lead to Biggie Smalls murder? I understand you're saying retaliation. Was there a, a sequence of events that happened? Like, or was mm -hmm. it? Okay. Yeah. So after, you know, when at the time when Suge Knight is seen stomping Orlando Anderson at the MGM in Las Vegas, he was on uh, probation. And so when the video surfaced of him participating in this, basically a gang fight, A, he was burnt. One of the conditions of his probation was that he's not to associate with gang members, nor to participate in any crimes, uh, nor to leave the state of California without expressed permission so all of these things added up to him getting his probation violated so when they um, violated his probation he is now going to go back to prison for the remainder of his previous sentence which was like an eight-year mm. parole sentence and so um when he violates that he goes back and now he's in county jail and tupac's dead death row is starting to kind of spiral you know down without their primary artist and with all the issues and internal fighting death row has started to kind of disintegrate and um he's in jail and becomes aware that both puffy combs and biggie smalls are coming back to california so they're going to be able in in the absence of death row now bad boy records is going to be able to establish it potentially on the west coast and kind of, you know, settle in, Suge's out of the way, he's in jail, prison, and Tupac's gone, is a perfect opportunity just to go and, you know, uh, establish ourselves. And so Suge became aware of that, and he reached out to one of the guys in the gang that he had a lot of prior history with, a very violent guy known for committing other murders, and he solicits that individual to do the shooting of Biggie. And so... That individual and probably with another accomplice 
go to the Peterson Auto Museum on March 9th of 1997, and they just lie in wait. And as Biggie and the rest of his entourage, including Puppy Combs, are driving away from the Peterson Auto Museum, which is the venue where this big party is taking place, um, he pulls up alongside the Suburban that Biggie's in, and basically it's a similar type of drive-by that Tupac was killed in. He just starts shooting, he gets Biggie, and Biggie dies before he gets to the hospital. So that's what happens to Biggie. Um, but it was all a retaliation for what happened to Tupac. And keep in mind, there was rumors. Rumors had been spreading for months that Biggie Smalls was in Las Vegas the night that Tupac was killed. Biggie Smalls had hired the Crips to kill Tupac, and that Biggie Smalls had provided the gun that was used to kill Tupac. That was all rumor that was, you know, that was festering. None of it was true. Right. But because those rumors were believed by people such as Suge Knight, Biggie then became the target of his retaliation. And that's why Biggie was shot and killed. And you, did you write a book about the investigation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, again, I was doing the cold case investigation, me and a whole team of people. It wasn't just me. It was... There was actually 16 of us in our task force. So it was a huge investigative effort by a bunch of different agencies and a bunch of different investigators. And so we ended up uh, getting all of these confessions. We got the confessions of PPD. He confessed to us in 2008, 2009. Um, and then a female who was an intermediary between Suge Knight and the actual gunman, her, she was one of Suge Knight's girlfriends. She was the one that was delivering the money and delivering the orders between Suge Knight and the gunman. She ends up confessing to her role um, in the murder in 2009. So now we have two confessions in these two um, you know, very, very well-known uh, unsolved murders. And so I ended up retiring in 2010. I wrote a book called Murder Rap, and I just detail in the book everything that took place in that investigation and how we got those confessions. Um, how was how was I, the uh, the woman involved? What was her part? Now she was one of Suge Knight's baby mamas. She had a daughter with Suge Knight. Um, she had been involved in a lot of white collar crime with Suge Knight, mostly fraud related stuff, bankruptcy fraud. Um, automobile fraud, um, licensing fraud, all of these different things. Suge would turn to her to do a lot of fraudulent activity on his behalf. So we were aware of all of that. So we knew that she was criminally complicit in a lot of different things that Suge was involved in. So when we approached her, we put her in a very bad position because we, were gonna, we told her, we're either going to charge you with these white collar crimes which means you're going to go to prison and your children are going to go into probably foster care. Or you can tell us what you know about all of these crimes. And we specifically asked her about the murder of Biggie Smalls, and she confesses that she was the intermediary, that she met with Suge Knight under the um, auspices of being a legal aid. So Suge Knight's attorney, this very savvy criminal defense attorney named David Kenner, he facilitated at the jail for her to go in and act as if she's one of his legal assistants. That allows Suge Knight to then have confidential conversations, non-monitored um, conversations, because of what we call privileged communications. Communications between you and your pastor, you and your doctor, you and your lawyer. Law enforcement can't monitor those. So he sets it up for her to have conversations privately with Suge while he's in jail. And that's when she says that Suge told her, I need you to reach out, Poochie. That was the nickname of the individual who is the killer. We need you to reach out to him, find out what he wants in return for killing Biggie. She comes back. She says he wants this amount of money. Suge says, fine. Suge facilitates for her to get the money. Um, she then makes those payments. And then she goes to the Peterson Auto Museum that night, the same night that Pucci shows up, and Pucci lies in wait and shoots and kills me. So she confesses to all of this. Does Suge Knight, I, I don't know, does, she, does he get charged? He's never been charged because all we have right now is just her, her testimony. 
against him. So it's he said, she said, we don't have any recordings of this conversation. It's just her word. And so even though we believe her and she's corroborated in many ways, trying to charge Suge Knight um, just with her testimony would not be very successful. She's got a long history of, of fraud, right. which is lying, essentially. Yeah. So she's got credibility issues. So, so what did she, problematic. she still end up going to jail? Because there was no, no prosecution. So, so both her, this is interesting. So both her and Keith D, when he confessed to his role in Tupac's murder, the way that we got these confessions is known under what's in law enforcement, so a proper agreement. Right. Where they and their attorneys will come in and sit down and have a conversation with us with the understanding that whatever they say won't be used against them. Doesn't mean they have immunity because any other information you develop that in, implicates them, you can use that. You can still charge them. So it's not immunity, but they are protected from their own self-incrimination. So we get these confessions back in 2009, but all we have now is this information. We have the truth of what happened according to these co-confessors, our co-conspirators, and but we can't really do too much with it. Both the shooters are dead by this time. Um, Pucci died in 2002. He also died like Orlando Anderson in a gang-related um, uh, homicide. And so years go by. And uh, Keefe feels like, well, all this time has gone by. I haven't been charged. And so he writes a book and starts to go on social media platforms and brags about his role. That's actually what lands him in jail with the female, with um, the other co-conspirator in Biggie's case. She doesn't say a word. She doesn't implicate herself in any way, shape or form other than the statement that she's given to us, which we can't use. <laughs> okay. So I don't understand. I mean, it seems like these guys are making money. Why are they still committing fraud and doing these stupid things that like they're already making money? Yeah, they are a bit, you know, consider the background. You know, um, they, you start making money, you want more money. You know, when is it ever enough? Sugar's was making a lot of money, but also they were spending a lot of money. So if you're going to have that kind of lifestyle where you're just spending millions of dollars, you better be bringing in millions of dollars. And so that was the cycle. It's like, well, yeah, we make a lot of money. We spend a lot of money. We eat more money. So where do you, where do you think all of this goes? If any place, you think it's kind of like, it's going to die out. Like you would need more people to come forward. You would need... Well, listen, like I said, all the co-conspirators, um, essentially, that were in the Cadillac that uh, rolled up and shot and killed Tupac, the three of those four are dead. The other fourth guy is being charged in that murder. So there's really nowhere else to go with that. It's now considered, it's no longer an unsolved case. Tupac's case is forevermore now a solved case. It's no longer a mystery. Uh, with Biggie's case, because nobody's been charged, it will remain what we call unsolved. Even though we know what happened, it will remain unsolved. And I really don't see um, the LAPD making a determination just to clear it right. based on the information that we currently know. It, it's funny. So I actually did, I've done a couple of paintings of Big, Biggie. Oh, wow. Um, because, oh, you know, cool. I, I got out of prison and I needed to do something, right? Like I need to make some money while I'm living in somebody's spare room and it's, you know, gotcha. and everybody knows I, I paint my buddies. So I had, uh, I ended up having, I ended up doing some paintings and then somebody came and said, Hey, can you paint a Biggie Smalls? And I was like, that sounds familiar. Like I didn't even write, <laughs> I looked him up and I, he's the guy sent me a picture. Oh, I said, wow. Yeah. Okay. So I did, I painted a couple paintings of him. I actually probably painted four. Um, painted okay. two, just specifically painted. And then I ended up doing what's called a a screen print, but it's like a modified screen print. I had modified it, made a screen print, and then each one is different. And I actually sell okay. those on a, on a website. But I've had other podcast guys buy them. And, uh, you know, so anyway, I it's like I, I had no idea who I mean, I, I barely knew who Biggie Smalls was, but yeah, I've actually, yeah. I've, I've painted a couple Tupacs too. I don't have any of those okay. left. I actually have some of the Biggies left, but <laughs> yeah. So it's like, listen, I didn't know anything about any of this until yeah. I, I got out like four, uh, four years ago and it just kept coming up and coming up. And so I, I 
looked into it a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't know anything about him either no. until I was assigned to investigate Biggie's murder. And then I had to get a quick education and I uh, learned about all this background. So what are you doing? What are you doing now? Um, I'm re I, I retired, like I said, in 2010, but then I opened up my own private investigations company. And so that kind of runs its course. And then I got into um, the book turned into a documentary. I published the book in 2011. It turns into a documentary in 2015. And then in like 2018, Netflix decides to do a limited series based on the book and the documentary. And it's called Unsolved, the Murders of Tupac and Biggie, um, which is still in like, you know, it's still three years ago that it made it to Netflix four years ago. And still one of the, you know, popular true crime limited series. So that was, I, you know, I was involved in all that, in those productions. I should have watched and they, that. They opened. What's that? So I should have watched that before we talked. Yeah. I had yeah, more questions. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty good. I thought it was well done. Um, obviously, there's some creative license taken when you're putting these type of things to, you know, together for television. But um, it was really fun. And then that opened doors to do other, to participate in some other um true crime documentaries okay so i stay busy i play golf <laughs> okay but the, the like, you know it's your passion you don't do the uh, but there's no more um uh the uh private investigator <laughs> you said that played at scores or yeah 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 i i uh I, you know i still have my company and i take jobs as they come and go just depending on what they are but um you know, I, I work with a bunch of associates. So for me, I can kind of just delegate right. some of that work to other people. Yeah. I mean, the next thing in that whole saga is going to be the trial of this individual who's being charged with Tupac's murder. And that's set for trial in June in Las Vegas. And so if he gets convicted, then that'll be the final nail in, in the, the coffin of that, of that story well i mean he's said it on multiple podcasts he wrote a book yeah. about it. i'm not sure what how much of a defense he has yeah his defense is they uh i was just i did that all for entertainment i was just mm. trying to make money and i was just bragging about it but, mm. um it doesn't it's i don't think it's gonna fly okay all right well yeah um do you have any unless you, want to talk about what, unless you want to talk about what you were in prison for I listen, I talk about what I was in prison for all the time. Okay. All the time. <laughs> I'll leave you alone. <laughs> I actually just did an interview with Lex Friedman. Um, oh wow. Yeah, it was that was actually pretty cool. That gave me a little awesome. boost on my subscribers and okay. you know, so uh that was it's funny too because it, it's all this almost irritates me. So, you know, I, I had a lot of time in prison, right? You, I, have, I have a lot of time to to do stuff and you know, you can't yeah. like you can't it's like what do you do? I I mean I I don't play softball. You know, I don't play handball. You can only walk the track so much. There's just not a lot to do. You know, your job is I taught GED and um, I taught a real estate class, which is funny, oh, wow. which is what I was in prison for, which was a uh, uh, bank fraud. Uh, it makes sense. But <laughs> related to real estate. So, but, so I started writing, I wrote my, I wrote my personal memoir while I was incarcerated and I wrote several other guys. You know, because there's so much okay. like you talk to these guys in prison, you're like, how is this not a movie? But right. he can't write his story, you yeah. know, or or they'll tell themselves, you know, most criminals are just laziness. You know, they're like, well, I'm going to do it when I get out. No, you're not. You've been locked up eight years. You're never going to have this much time in your life. You're So right. I would negotiate a deal with them where it's like, look, if you attach your life rights, I'll write a synopsis of your story. It'll be 10,000 words. And so yeah. I would, I got some guys in Rolling Stone magazine doing that. I got some publicity. I optioned some of those stories and then I wrote some of them. I turned into books. I mean, keep in mind, I had a ton of time. So, yeah. uh, you know, and I'm ordering freedom of information acts, uh, freedom of <laughs> public records acts. I'm ordering court documents. I'm getting transcripts. Like I'm getting this stuff through the mail. And so it's a long, arduous process, but you know, super fun. Like it's like being a detective, right? Like it's like, oh my gosh, look what I just now this makes sense and that. And you know, you so uh listen, a lot of these times I knew more about these guys' cases than they did. Wow. You know? So, you know, because a lot of these guys they get arrested, like, yeah, that's when I got arrested. I'm like, well, yeah, I understand it's when you got arrested, but how did the cops know you were there? Yeah. And they're like, 
I don't know. Somebody gave me up. Who? I don't know. You never asked? You never looked into it? I mean, I pled guilty. I'm, they called me with a gun. I'm a convicted felon with a gun. I got crack on me. I got this. I'm not going to trial. Like, yeah, I'm trying to get the best deal I can. So they don't need, so I'm not asking questions. I'm done. Yeah. So you're like, wow. so, resistance. right. So I would order their documents and I'd come back and I'd say, okay, do you know a guy named Pookie? And I say, because he robbed a 7-Eleven with this guy. They caught that guy. That guy gave up this guy. Then he told the detectives that he knew somebody that was selling drugs to you. And, and he's like, oh my God. And they were like, I, ne- I never realized his aunt set me up. You know, it was a whole thing. So, I mean, that would happen often. I'd say that's not, you know, he'd tell me, somebody would think they knew what happened. And you get the, you get the FBI 302s and you're like, it's not what happened. Like that guy didn't cooperate. Like somebody else, you know, somebody you went to high school and dated and they'd be, they'd go, oh, Jennifer, you know. Even though it's redacted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, I wrote all these guys stories and I got out. Awesome. So back to, back to Lex, the, I was talking, I told my story on Lex, right? Long podcast. Cause I'm a talker. So, but in the, in it, I talk about the guy that filed, he filed two 2255s for me. So, you know, 2255, it's like a, uh, is that a Florida thing? No, no, it's a federal, it's a federal, um, okay. it's a habeas action where you're saying your, your, your attorney was ineffective. Okay. So you're saying, uh, you know, I got the incorrect sentence. I was given yeah, bad information. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I talk about the guy who filed those for me and his story and why he was in prison. He's a disbarred attorney. So I tell his whole story briefly, really quickly, which was amazing story. He's a rapid cycling bipolar with features of schizophrenia. He's got a law degree. He, he's disbarred and um, ultimately started several companies. Uh, and he did what's called a, it's, it's payroll withholding taxes for these oh. massive companies that he owned, like 30, 40,000 employees. I mean, multiple companies. He ends up being like a, you know, he's one of these guys that goes in and puts in tons of money and takes over companies. And uh, I forget what they call that. But anyway, so He's doing this for years, but what he does is part of his plan was he would take over these companies that are failing and he would stop paying in the payroll tax mm. to the government. And then he would negotiate when it got to be 5 million, 10 million, he'd negotiate it down and then on, go on a payment plan. But really he's taking that money and he's diverting it. He ends up diverting yeah. like $180 million. And in his mind, he's doing this because he thinks he wants to, he's, he thinks ultimately he's going to take over the world. Since he was a teenager, wow. because of the schizophrenia, since he's a teenager, yeah. he's periodically heard the voice of God telling him, and this is how he says it, he's preordained to be emperor of the world. And it, I know it sounds insane, right? It just sounds, yeah. true, but everybody- yeah, would, no, yeah. Schizophrenia is a bitch, man. Right. But look, he became a lawyer. Then when right. he lost his license, he opened up all of these, he became this huge investor, bought all these companies. Yeah. Tried to take so over the Congo. He owned several um, private military, uh, you know, what, what are they called? You know, private security companies. They have contracts in Afghanistan. I mean, this, I got pictures of him with George Bush. I got pictures of him with politicians. Um, wow. I, you know, he was in, he backed NATO. He backed a NATO summit. He was one of the backers of a NATO summit. It, it's it's an insane story. I mean, it's so much bigger than, of course, what I did. So, yeah. I kind of tell this story briefly on Lex Friedman. His book has shot through the roof. Really? I mean, I, I, it's almost like it's irritating because I used to sell double whatever, at least double to triple whatever he sold. His book is outselling my book. And I'm like, I talked about my story for six hours. I talked about him for five <laughs> minutes. But it's such, it is such a great story. Such a great story. So that, that sounds like a, uh, that, so that should be a good option. Right? Like I've option. It's so funny too because. Yeah. I think the problem is what, when I have spoken with producers, I have always yeah. approached those conversations as um, documentaries saying this would make yeah. a great documentary. Cause I think that's like the low bar you can get a documentary. And if it does well, then you can get a series, right? Yeah, so right. I think, Hey, entry level documentary, you don't need a lot of money. They don't have to be perfect. A lot of these guys are out here. We can interview them. That's a huge plus. So, but really the truth is like this guy, he's never going to cooperate. 
even though he loved the fact that I wrote the book, he was giving it out to people. He loves the story. He's, he's all over the place. And so I always see like a, a series like house of cards yeah, type of series where, you know, not he's president, but he's the president of this company and he's doing these bizarre things and he's guy, people are doing stuff for him and he's putting this together and he's schmoozing with politicians and there's backstabbing. Like, I think that would be, there's a whole documentary. He tried to take over the Congo uh, during the elections and. Is he a white guy? Yeah. Yeah. It's a documentary. It's called the nine days in the Congo. It's on YouTube. And uh, no yeah, it's Frank Amadeo. But it, you got to get Jim Carrey attached to that. Yeah. And it'll just get Jim Carrey and he'll, he's the perfect guy to play that. I used to always say, um, oh gosh, what's his name? He was married to uh, Roseanne Barr, a uh, Tom Arnold. Oh, he's, okay. That's the kind of image of that guy. Yeah, he's very similar. I mean, oh, wow. he was okay. sporadic. Like you would, let me give you an example. You'd be talking to him one day about legal work because he's doing legal work. He's essentially running a, a medium-sized law firm from inside of prison. Like he filed my all my paperwork because the, the lawyers on the street, I had 26 years. The lawyers on the street were all telling me, yeah, there's nothing you can do. So I finally go to this guy. He gets seven years knocked off my sentence. And then a year later, he gets five more years knocked off my sentence. So I end up doing 13 years on 26. He got 12 years knocked off my sentence. But what's interesting is you would, and I used to sit near him all the time. We had like a close table or I'd sit at the table with him and he would be sitting there talking to some inmate. The guy's telling him about his story. Yeah. And a bunch of guys around him kind of, you know, helping him. They do legal work for him. They type up the motions. He's got a little team. And he, you'd be telling me, you'd be telling Frank your, your story. And he would go, that makes me so angry. I, I, I can't believe they've done this, you know, based on Johnson versus Brown in the United States, they cannot do this. And then he would go straight manic and, and he'd go when that is exactly what, when my troops march on Washington, I will burn the constitution and the president will kneel at my feet. <laughs> and everybody would just be totally steel, still. You, like, you don't say anything. You're just like, holy shit. And then he'd go, okay, I'm going to need a 2255 form. I'm going to need you to give me a copy of your uh, of your your transcripts. I'm also going to need your sentencing transcripts. I'm going to need a copy of your indictment, and I'm going to need your PSI. Okay, get that as soon as possible. And the guys would be like, uh, uh, okay, Frank, okay. And then they'd walk in. Right. That's it. You just go right back into it, and you forget about that completely. That's right. what I was dealing with. <laughs> That's fantastic. It's almost like a, I mean, there's just a touch of genius there, you know. Oh, yeah, like, oh. Which is so sad because, you know, having been in prison, like I've met many schizophrenics and many, many people with bipolar disorder, obviously. So, a lot of them end up in prison. And it, it's funny yeah. that how many of them are just super <sighs> smart, but <laughs> chemically they're just so unbalanced. They, yeah. They end up doing really, you know, sometimes they're, sometimes they're just stupid things and sometimes they're horrific. So, you know. Yeah. When they fall off their meds, holy smokes, yeah. it goes sideways fast. And, and then they don't want to take their meds because they take them, they start feeling normal and then they think, I don't need, I don't need these. I'm good. Yeah. It's like, no, good. <laughs> no. Yeah. What well, the cycle right there. Uh. Well, listen, I, I will let you go. Okay, hey buddy. Um, hey, thanks for sharing that. That was actually great. Love that story. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. If you, listen, if you send me your address, like if you text me your address, okay. I'll mail you a copy of the book. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, Thank it's you. Rolling Stone article. To, tell me about the Rolling Stone article. Yeah, it just dropped today. At least uh, I just got a, a copy of the online issue. I don't know if it's at the newsstands yet, but yeah, this big Rolling Stone article that the the author has been working on for almost two months, I think. It just dropped today and it really lays out all of the different aspects of Tupac's murder and how we got to where we're at today. And it's a really, really well written story and a great read. So anybody that's interested in knowing a little bit more than we've talked about here, I would recommend you looking at that Rolling Stones uh, article that just dropped. But also I wanted to plug that uh, me and my producing partner, a guy named Mike Dorsey, we just started our own YouTube channel. It's called The Murder Rap. Right. So The Murder Rap on YouTube. And Mike puts together these really great short deep dive videos that go into different 
components of both Biggie and Tupac's murder. So that's, we're getting this thing up and running. So I'm hoping that people will kind of, you know, drift over there and, and look at the channel and, uh, and hopefully follow and like it. Because uh, we, we'd love to see it grow. And we're yeah. going to just continue to build it into something uh, I think that people will appreciate. Is the whole channel just, it's not, right now it's on, it's on the, the Tupac and Biggie, but ultimately are you planning on interviewing people or? Oh yeah, we're going to build this. So first of all, we're just going to do these little deep dive videos. You kind of see the quality of the stuff that my partner produces, but we're ultimately going to go into the whole gamut of true crime. We're working on a big documentary right now. We're going to, we're going to have an accompanying uh, podcast on uh, this story about a guy named Christopher Dorner, who back in 2013 was this rogue, disgruntled LAPD cop that went on a shooting spree and killed a bunch of people and a really fascinating story. And it's very relevant to today because of the social environment that we live in with gun issues and racial issues and blah, blah, blah. So we're going to really explore that. It's never been done before in any kind of comprehensive way. We've got another serial killer case we're working on. So we're, we're going to be doing a whole bunch of true crime stuff as, uh, as, as we move forward. You know what might be interesting too is I always remember the uh, kind of like the movie Heat was semi based on the the that uh, shootout where the the bank robbery yeah we call it the EFA shooting yeah that yeah. was that was like I've always wondered what those guys' backstory was right you know? like obviously we know how it ended but the backstory to how that ended up happening you know and, and the things that they had done and been in and out of prison how they ended up. You know, how do you bump into a buddy and say, hey, let's go rob a bank or I yes. mean, they rob, rob several, I, I know, but um, I'm pretty sure. Right. Hadn't they robbed several? Oh, you, you are so right about that. And I'm so surprised that nobody's really told that story in any kind of cohesive, comprehensive way, because that's an incredible event in L.A. history. And, and some of the guys I used to work with at Robbery Homicide Division were actual investigators on that case. So that's a great that's a great story that's yet untold. Look, look, how cool is that too? You just have one of those guys over, like you're going to have a studio, yeah. you'll have them over to the studio. You don't even have to do that much research. You just have a conversation and he can lay out exactly, he probably knows all the backstory and everything to those guys and how it ended up. Tell that for two, over the course of two or three hours, you know, break it up, stop, have oh, lunch, whatever. That's, like that. that's great. It, I appreciate you so much. Thank you, first of all, for suggestions, but your willingness and generosity in helping to, you know, helping, helping us, helping another yeah. person who's trying to do what you do. It's, it's funny. That's, that's the funny thing I've always, I, I've no, I've, there's a couple, some people that are kind of like competitive YouTubers, mm. but for the most part, I'd say 90% of the guys that I've met are always willing to help. That's great. You know? No. Um, yeah. So, but yeah. And if, like I said, if you, if you want, you know, I can give you a slew of names. I mean, they won't all be kind of law enforcement. You know, if you're, That's if you, if you don't mind going on a few that are, um, you know, that are, are like former criminals, but you know, well, I have, I, I, th those are the best conversations. Right. <laughs> I'm not necessarily interested in always talking to cops, right. you know, I know that world well enough. Um, and we, <laughs> so yeah, I really enjoy, um, listening to the stories of other people's lives and, and sharing the story of my own bit. Um, like I went on the Babylon B <laughs> years ago. Okay. You well, know, you know what that is. A, oh, you don't know the Babylon well, B? Well, I was probably in prison. I've only been out like four years. So I don't oh, know yeah, anything. It's, it's, it's huge. Um, they're a satire. Okay. Uh, they do satire, but it's really, really funny stuff. Very conservative satire. I'll so look at, I'll look I, I went on that knowing that it was going to be half, you know, half-hearted and or not half-hearted, but uh, it wasn't going to be something you have to go on and be really serious with. So I love that. I love all the different genres and styles. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching the interview. If you liked it, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell so you get notified of videos just like this. Also, please consider joining my clips channel. I have a clips channel where I'll take a video like this and cut them up into the essential story so you don't have to watch an hour long podcast. And please consider joining my Patreon. Thank you guys so much. See ya.